She's been on with us before. She hosts Fast Politics. And if you're on Threads, still trying to keep Threads alive, <laughs> she is a must follow on Threads. I think it's like we're finding a losing battle so far, but Molly, I think it's you and I. Uh, very grateful to Molly Chong Fast, who is reveling in uh, the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the, the, the general sense that people who aren't welcome on Twitter are now welcome on Threads. I, I want to talk to you about what happened last night with the Republican debates, but I'd like to talk to you mainly first about how you're positioning yourself to be a must-follow on Threads. Okay, I this is the first time I've ever been interviewed about threads, but uh, yes, threads were trying hard to, to pour. <laughs> that should be I, the, that should be the slogan. Threads, yes, we're trying hard. We're trying hard. I feel bad. I feel like it's like the only thing that could make me like uh, Mark Zuckerberg is Elon Musk. Same, same. Right? It found it found a way to make Mark Zuckerberg, by comparison, the likable one. <laughs> Right, exactly. The slightly less awful tech billionaire, still nefarious, but not quite as nefarious, and does not espouse real white supremacist talking points. That guy, we're trying to keep alive his, uh, you know, he has billions of dollars. I mean, I, I, look, who knows how this goes? Uh, it does seem like um, uh, Elon is trying to make Twitter as, or sorry, X as unusable as possible for hmm. seemingly no reason. It, it, it feels to me like Mark Zuckerberg is taking this opportunity to embrace a face turn, which I find yeah. bizarre because if, like, on the balance of things, you could argue Zuckerberg has done more to destroy American democracy yeah. than Elon Musk is presently uh, attempting to do. Yes. But with his messaging, with his by comparisoning, that he is doing right. lately, right. even with uh, even with his relatability, which is impossible. Yeah. He's never been able to relate to anybody. It does feel like Zuckerberg is keenly aware that there is a lane for him to get back in good graces. <laughs> yes. Last nefarious tech billionaire is a lane that is wide open <laughs> for, for, for Mark Zuckerberg. And uh, I hope he takes it. I mean, look, it's hard not to seem less nefarious than Elon Musk, right? I mean, every day he's engaging with some terrifying white supremacist. He's espousing these talking points, you know, the great replacement theory. That's not a mainstream theory, thank God. That's a really scary kind of right-wing theory that bleeds into, you know, a lot of scary stuff. So I am, I, I'm a little bit relieved that, I mean, the reality is Zuckerberg is much better at what he does at, at this social media world than Elon. Now, does that mean Threads wins? Not necessarily, but if you were to look at history, Elon has done pretty well with Tesla and pretty well with SpaceX. But uh, since he's had Twitter, it's been just a complete, incomplete freefall. Switching gears now to what happened last night. And at the conclusion of this show, I'm literally hopping on a plane to get out of this country because <laughs> you mentioned the word relief. And I, I do, I have found relief in the last couple of years that I, right. I've gotten away from the day in and day out of what did he do now? How did he embarrass our mm -hmm. country now? But I did not, even though there were debates last night that didn't feature like the biggest trigger for me, which is Donald Trump, it included several triggers. And it seems as though uh, no one really took the opportunity presented to them from what I'm reading. And maybe you can tell me different. I don't know what the vibe is on threads right now. Uh, <laughs> it seems like nobody really took the opportunity that was presented to them, which is use this opportunity without Donald Trump in the room to separate yourself a little bit, not be a coward and, and try to disassociate yourself from the, the, the general direction that the Republican Party, if we can even call it that anymore, is headed in who succeeded last night who failed did everybody fail uh so i would say that the big winners last night were vivek and not because he's great but because i think he he illustrated a really important and interesting point which is that the only person who is going to take the republican party away from a complete charlatan a charismatic uh, salesman is another charismatic salesman. So 
you know, you had all these fancy Republicans, uh, the sort of elites saying, no, it's all about policy. We just run this guy who's also even more right wing, Ron DeSantis, a sort of less charismatic mimeograph of the OG and uh, will win. But it turns out that the base does not care about policy at all. This was never about building the wall. This was merely about getting these guys excited. And Vivek is able to do that in the same way Trump was. So do I think he's going to be the nominee? Absolutely not. But do I think that there's a lesson there with this Republican base that they are susceptible to that kind of charlatan? Yes. Yes, I do. How weird was it hearing Vivek use an Obama quote during his opening speech during the debate? And it was incredible. And you saw they called him on it, right? I, I, I Was it Nikki Haley or was it, I think it was um, Chris Christie who called him on it. It was weird. I mean, it, that was wild stuff. And, and I have to say, like, you know, Obama had been, was a senator. He was, you know, the idea that he's at all comparable to Vivek, who's just a charlatan, is <laughs> uh, complete madness. I want to concentrate a little bit on Ron DeSantis, which um, seemingly had the backing of Fox News early on, um, right. had kin- king-making moment after king-making moment. Uh, he actually, his term as as governor, for those that voted for him, and even maybe some independents, um, with the, uh, the benefit of hindsight, maybe realize, okay, the Florida went about COVID a different way than <laughs> than everybody else. But in retrospect, okay, just on the merits of keeping business alive, he, pop, he, he certainly positioned himself to be a star. And ever right. since then, ever since he launched this presidential campaign, he has undone Ron DeSantis, the governor, to the point that he is actually laying down his, his shield a little bit and backing off from the Disney stuff. Has Ron DeSantis, with this at this point, failed presidential bid, ruined his legacy as a governor. Yeah, and I don't, I I would argue that his legacy as a governor, first of all, COVID was a once in a life, and let's hope at least, once in my lifetime pandemic. So the idea that all of a sudden, that people should have immediately known, Mm -hmm. you know, like they closed the playgrounds, like they shouldn't have closed the playgrounds, but nobody knew how it was, you know, that you couldn't get it outside or that you were much less likely to get it outside. I mean, we were, the learning curve was like a, just a completely sharp uphill. And so mistakes were made by many, many people. And so I don't know that, and DeSantis like, killed a lot of old people. Yeah. So like the idea that this guy is somehow, you know, and did he, I mean, maybe he kept the public schools open slightly more, slightly longer, and look, the school should have opened sooner and maybe they should have never closed because younger people were not affected the same way as older people. But they didn't know that at the time. And you didn't want to be wrong. You know, you didn't want to have a room filled with dead children. I mean, except when it comes to school shootings, in which case Republicans are fine with that. But um, you didn't want to have a, you know, you didn't want to be wrong on that. And so people took an abundance of caution and, and they were wrong on some things, but I don't know how he does a victory lap. What I would say about DeSantis is, DeSantis didn't win because he was uh, a great governor. He won because he was running against a terrible candidate who had been a Republican five Mm -hmm. minutes ago, who was just a complete disaster, and a Democratic Party that in Florida had been completely decimated. So did he win by 10 points? Yes. Should he probably have won by one or two points? Yeah. Like, it's just not dispositive to take that victory and extrapolate from there. Uh, a lot of the candidates actually went after the teachers union and wanting yeah. to get rid of the uh, Department of Education. How is that going to help? I mean, that's like a GOP talking point that they're very excited about. They hate the teachers union. Uh, again, what we've seen, if the big problem is inequity, if the big problem is people not making enough, then a union is a solution for that. So I don't know how destroying the Look, the teachers union was wrong. They should not have kept schools closed as long as they did. But again, this is one of these things. Hindsight is twenty twenty. If we knew what the virus did back then, we could have said, no, you got to keep the schools open. So I don't know. I mean, that's just there are so many of these weird boogeymen that Republicans love. They're going to abolish the Department of Education, but they're not, you know, but they're going to make sure. I mean, it just doesn't. It's just like a very, you know, these people ultimately hate government, right? So they just want to kill government. But they, spoiler, they work in government.
yeah, government and debt balloons under their president, and yet right. uh, it doesn't seem to stick to them. And by the way, I know some teachers here in the state of Florida, and it's terrifying what's happening to their curriculum right. right now. And they're taking a page out of Communist Cuba's book, in which they'll use the education system to fully indoctrinate people on their right. version of the past and a terrifying vision of the future. And there's not enough teachers at all in this state. Right. That's well, that's no, and they're incentivizing right. charter schools. Right. Or making it. That's how they're winning some of the people over, which is, oh, you're going to pay me to go to a charter school. So, the, And while taking a hatchet to public school curriculum, it's a very right. terrifying thing. But uh, there's a lot to be scared of here just on this planet alone. But what about the threat outside of this planet? From last night, I saw this clip. And Chris Chrissy, who is probably, by comparison, the one that is most staunchly anti-Trump in that he's not right. afraid to go at him, he probably lost any consideration that I would give him by his soft answer on UFOs. We have a clip. For you, <laughs> Governor Christie, do you believe that the recent spike in UFO encounters... Oh. <laughs> I get the UFO <laughs> question? Is, yeah, you do. Come on, there man. Okay, we've been hearing a lot of, we've been hearing a lot of testimony in Congress, and people are taking this a lot more seriously, and we're hearing that, you know, there are things going on that people aren't aware of. So, if you were president, Governor Christie, would you level with the American people about what the government knows about these possible Look, Martha, and especially coming from a woman from New Jersey, I, I think it's horrible that just because I'm from New Jersey, you asked me about unidentified flying objects and Martians. Um, we're different, but we're not that different. Um, look. Deeply troubling. UFOs are no laughing matter. And I think it shows the, the ignorance of the human race in how everyone in that room laughed. It's a very real thing. They might be coming from the ocean. Molly? Oh, yeah. Thank you for this question. Um, you know, look, the, again, this is like, uh, I'm just going to, Trump did a, did a very lame interview with Tucker Carlson last night in which Tucker Carlson said, like, did Epstein kill himself? Trump was president. He was president when Epstein died. He was president during, you know, whatever UFO thing may or may not have happened. Like, he had the opportunity, right? He was president. He could have, I mean, I feel like there's a continual uh, kind of like, you know, he had this opportunity to do whatever he want. Declassify all the JFK documents. I don't care. I mean, you know, lock up Hunter Biden. I mean, these are like these things there, you know, he was president. He could have done anything he wanted. And and so that, I think, is a large sort of failing on the part of Republicans. What is the disconnect between Republicans and Democrats? Well, not, I know there's a lot of disconnects. But when right. it comes to the Hunter Biden thing, whenever you hear about Trump's indictments, quickly people will snap back with Hunter Biden as if there are anything within the same stratosphere. But let's entertain this. Why do they think Democrats will toe the line that, well, since he's a Democrat, we don't want him to go to jail? Where I think I'm like most people, which is if you break the law, if they do an investigation, if you were found by a free and fair court that you did something wrong, yeah, serve time, serve a punishment. I don't get this where just because someone is like Donald Trump, our guy, they right. can just break the law and everyone's cool with it because he's on our side. There's a huge disconnect between Democrats and Republicans. Like, we hear you. We're just not like that. Sure. Go after Hunter Biden if he did something wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm i fine with that. First of all, who even knows if Hunter Biden's a Democrat? I mean, right. I assume he votes Democrat. But, you know, is, President's son is a meaningless term to me. If he did something wrong, lock him up, send him, you know, send him to jail. It doesn't affect anything. I think the idea here is this uh, Steve Bannonism. You flood the zone with an expletive and you make it seem like everyone is corrupt, is as corrupt as Trump, so that then you don't have to answer for the fact that your guy has been indicted on two sets of state charges, two sets of federal charges, and a superseding indictment. I mean, the head of the Republican Party, the front runner, is out on bail and surrendering again. Yeah. And his lead increases seemingly with every indictment, as if that doesn't yeah. say more to the, the present state of affairs. Molly, uh, always enjoy having you on the show. Thank you so much. Don't be a stranger. And quite honestly, maybe revisit your answer on the UFO thing, because I kind of feel like you dismissed it, too. <laughs>
when it's very I'm clearly sorry, a sorry. threat. It's it's yeah. a, it's a threat. I, listen, out. I'm hoping to get uh, you know kidnapped by them. So all right, fast politics is the name of the podcast. Molly Jong, fast follower on Threads. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.